This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Shea. We spend the rest of the hour with the legendary award-winning author Arunthati Roy. She won the Booker Prize in 1997 for her novel The God of Small Things. In 2017, 20 years after the publication of her first novel, she published another work of fiction, which is just out in paperback, titled The Ministry of Utmost Happiness. This is a clip from a short film introducing the novel, narrated by Arunthati Roy and directed by Sanjay Kak and Tarun Bhartia. She lived in the graveyard like a tree. At dawn, she saw the crows off and welcomed the bats home. At dusk, she did the opposite. When people called her names, clown without a circus, queen without a palace, she let the hurt blow through her branches like a breeze and used the music of her rustling leaves as balm to ease the pain. Who says my name is Anjum? I'm not Anjum. I'm Anjuman. I'm a mehfil. I'm a gathering of everybody and nobody, of everything and nothing. Is there anyone else you'd like to invite? Everyone's invited. Dear Comrade Azad Bhartia Garu, my comrade Suguna knows to send this letter to you when she hears that I am no more. As you know, we are banned underground people, and this letter from me you can call as underground of underground. How to tell a shattered story? by slowly becoming everybody. No, by slowly becoming everything. That's a short film introducing Arundhati Roy's most recent book. The film is directed by Sanjay Kak and Tarun Bhartia. The Ministry of Utmost Happiness was long listed for the Booker Prize and nominated for the National Book Critics Circle Award. The Washington Post praised the book, writing, quote, This is a remarkable creation, a story both intimate and international, swelling with comedy and outrage, a tale that cradles the world's most fragile people, even while it assaults the subcontinent's most brutal villains. It will leave you awed by the heat of its anger and the depth of its compassion. Indian literary critic Nalanjana Roy hailed the novel as, quote, an elegy for a bulldozed world. Arundhati Roy received the 2002 Lannan Foundation Cultural Freedom Prize, and her journalism and essays have been collected in several books, including The End of Imagination, Field Notes on Democracy, Listening to Grasshoppers, and Capitalism, A Ghost Story. Arundhati Roy, welcome back to the United States and Thank to Democracy you. Now! Thank you, Amy. It's a great honor to be with you. So your book has just come out in paperback, and we want to talk, we want to talk about also the response to it over this year. But why don't you start off by talking about why you chose to go back to writing a novel and the title, The Ministry of Utmost Happiness? Uh, well, you know, when I finished, uh, when I wrote The God of Small Things, I, I never ever saw myself as a person who, you know, because I'd written a successful book, I had to just keep doing the same thing. And I, I always said that I'd only write a book when I had a book to write. And for 20 years, I spent sort of traveling through India um, in, in, you know, in the valleys and the forests where the in Kashmir, in in the forest of Bastar, trying to understand the the very massive and sudden changes that were happening, you know, particularly post uh, what they call globalization, you know, and the and 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 it was obvious that that this new economy was traveling parallel with a, a, a huge impetus of Hindu nationalism, and the both were com traveling companions. And now, of course, you, you know, it's at its, <clears throat> at its peak. The, the battles are both so joined at the hip. And I, uh, 
If I could just interrupt briefly, <coughs> Arantati, yeah. if you could just explain the context uh, uh, in which liberalization or globalization mm -hmm. came in to India, what accounted for the transformation uh, of the economy after really decades uh, uh, of a different kind of economic system? Well, obviously, until, uh, you know, 1990, India was what, I mean, India called itself a non-aligned state. It had a uh, a protected economy, an economy that was doing badly, by the way, you know, for reasons that we all know of massive corruption, of this very, very centralized forms of development. But after, basically after the end of the war in Afghanistan, you know, I mean, the war hasn't ended in Afghanistan, but after the collapse of the Soviet Union in Afghanistan, it became, India became completely aligned. Now it thinks of itself as an ally of Israel and the U.S. And the markets, and, and when the world became unipolar, now, now it's collapsing that, but then the markets were opened. And liberalization entered uh, at a speed which was hard to imagine, you know. Every form of protection to workers was dismantled, rivers, forests, everything was privatized. Now education, health, all of it is, is in a state of uh, collapse, you know. In a way, the polarization that we all know globalization brings is happening, and you have... It was almost as though... You had a feudal country, which a feudal and colonized country, which in 1947, from 1947 to 1990, tried, even if symbolically, you know, to, uh, I mean, the radical movements in the 60s, for example, were talking about the redistribution of wealth, the redistribution of land, of justice, of revolution. But suddenly, um, this new economy has pushed even the radical discourse into a space where people are just asking to let, let's say, indigenous people continue to live on what little land they have instead of it being taken over by the corporation. The idea of redistribution is, is over. And, y and yet you have a situation where, in a way, it's a form of corporate feudalism because the land which belonged to the upper castes now belong to the corporates which are upper caste, you know. So caste, feudalism, capitalism, all of it merges in a, in a very unique way in, in, that, in that place, you know. And you had, for example, you had 50 years of some gesture towards what we call reservation, what you call affirmative action. Now... Uh, you have privatization in which Dalits are being pushed out all over again, pushed out of educational institutions, pushed out of jobs, pushed out of... So, so you have the consolidation of upper caste, upper class capitalism. You have a situation where, uh, uh, like everywhere else, you know, 100 families own 25 percent or something of the GDP. And you have a consolidation of inequality, which is incredible. But how do you manage that in a place like that? You manage it by, by uh, with the flag of Hindu nationalism, by making people who are actually losing feel that they are winning the Hindu nation. And you isolate the Muslim community. Last, uh, last election proved that you don't need the Muslim vote. So the Muslims of India, who number maybe 150 to 200 million people, are actually now surplus people. They are not; re their vote is not required. Mm -hmm. their, the, their, their, the, the, the work through which they have sustained themselves, you know, the meat industry, the cattle industry, the leather industry, all under attack, shut down. So they've been pushed to the bottom. They are being ghettoized, lynched. Uh, so, so you, you know, Hindu nationalism is the management policy to, to, uh, to quell the unrest that liberalization has brought.
Well, let me just go back, because the initial question that, that Amy asked had been about, and I'd interrupted you, uh, about what brought you back to fiction. So in a way, when you wrote The God of Small Things, which came out in 1997, yeah. is that right? Uh, the, the, at that moment, it, that's when these massive transformations as a result of liberalization were coming in and accelerating uh, in, in India. So uh, could you explain the time that you spent in these 20 years, uh, the kind of writing you did then, and why, I mean, you've been working on this book, The Ministry, for, for the last 10 years. So what brought you back uh, uh, to fiction? Well, uh, you know, after I wrote uh, The God of Small Things and when it won the book, uh, I've spoken about this many times, you know, I was suddenly sort of being uh, marketed as the face of this new liberal, new liberal India, which was, a, which was something I was very uncomfortable with. And then in uh, 1998, uh, the, the BJP government, the NDA, the National Demo Democratic Alliance, the BJP being the main party, came in and did the, a series of nuclear tests. And for me, somehow, the national, those tests, you know, changed the national discourse in terms of what is acceptable to be said openly. You know, it isn't that the, I mean, the RSS, which is the party, the, the organization which Modi belongs to, the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, which has always believed that India should be declared a Hindu nation, was actually formed in 1925. So we are watching something that has been inexorably growing to this place. So it's not that the nuclear tests started something new, but they jump-started a discourse. Uh, they allowed things to be said in public that were not acceptable earlier. They gave that a kind of acceptance. And then I wrote uh, this essay called The End of Imagination, and so suddenly the, the fairy princess was kicked off her pedestal. But that led me into 20 years of following what was going on, you know, the, anti the protests against dams, the, you know, for, for example, I wrote a big essay called The Greater Common Good about the protest against the Narmada. And, and to me, the... The, the Narmada Dam. The Narmada Dam, sorry, the dams that are built on this Narmada River. And to me, that political understanding and education that I received from that movement, I see the bones of, the sacrificial bones of this uniquely Indian fascism really in the foundations of that dam. You know, really the idea that there is a community that is more entitled than another, the idea that you can take the water from a river valley, centralize it in a dam reservoir, and then decide who should, who should get that water. I mean, recently, now that the dam is built, now that everything that the anti-dam movement has said has come true, we had an incredible spectacle of whatever little water there was in the reservoir, which should have been used for the farmers of Gujarat through the drought months, given what the dam said it was going to do, was released in a rush the day just weeks before the Gujarat election, for what? For the prime minister to land a seaplane as an election spectacle. And today, that water is gone, and what little water there is in the canal is being protected by the police from farmers who need it. You know, this is fascism. It's not just concentration camps, you know. So I... I uh, I mean, 20 years of, of traveling, of seeing, of writing, but all those essays were always very urgent interventions in a situation that was closing down. There was some, something very urgent about the way they were written. But simultaneously, there was all this kind of gathering in me. For example, the travels in Kashmir. I could not write about Kashmir. Nobody really can easily write about Kashmir in non-fiction, because what happens there is not just based on what evidence you can pr produce, you know, the, the terror that seeds the air, the terror of living, 
in the most dense military occupation in the world, half a million soldiers. The the complicated... Which most people here really know almost nothing, nothing about. Nothing about. I mean, just imagine the fact that just in the last few, two or three years, a new technique of firing pellet guns into crowds has blinded completely or partially more than a thousand people. A thousand people, you know. But under the banner of this market-friendly democracy, no one's going to talk about it. Under the banner of a democracy that buys huge amounts of weapons from France, from America, we are being courted. Our, uh, uh, all those dark secrets are, are being swept under the carpet because we are buying weapons from the West. And how will the West survive if if we idiots don't buy weapons. Yeah. Well, Kashmir is one of the places that features prominently in your uh, in, in the Ministry of Utmost Happiness. It's one of the settings of the book. Now, you've pointed out, as people have said, this book is suffused with politics, with the implication being that somehow fiction stands apart uh, from politics or partisanship. Uh, you said in a recent interview that the elite are partisan and so privileged that they don't uh, need to appear uh, to be. So could you explain that and also... Uh, the reception of your book in India in those terms? Well, look, uh, you know, I've always find, found it remarkable. I mean, The God of Small Things was a political book. After it won the Booker Prize, people in, uh, in India especially, but a lot of people, particularly in Kerala, w you know, liked to think about it because they wanted to claim me, but not the politics of the book. So let's ignore the fact that it's about the most brutal and ancient social hierarchy that any human society has produced, which is caste. Let's not talk about that. It can be a book about children, or it can be a book very lyrically written, and so on. But for me, the fact is that for fiction writers, to avoid writing about caste, to avoid writing about Kashmir, you have to assume some extremely complicated yoga posture, you know. The real thing is, can you look at the air, can you breathe? This is the air we breathe there. It's not just horror. It's music, it's poetry, it's Kashmir, it's caste, it's all of that, you know. So I don't, uh, I, I, I am not in the least bit uh, shy of saying that, that to me, it's, it's, as a writer, to be able to write about love, to be able to write about intimacy, about music, about poetry and violence with the same uh, intensity is what matters to me. But to try and edit out these things because you don't think that maybe the market wants it, I don't care about that. Well, Arundhati, tell us the plot of the book. It, it begins and ends in a cemetery. Um, uh, Hindus are not buried in cemeteries. They are cremated, so they're Muslim. And it's about, really, not the fringe minority, but the fringe majority, uh, in a sense. But tell us about the characters, how unusual this book is. Well, look, I mean, that's a rather mean question. Tell me the plot of the book. <laughs> it's difficult to say, to answer that. To me, um, what, what, what can I say? I, I, I think of it as a, as a city. You know, the, the plot is a city, like a big city of my part of the world. It has an old walled section. It has people trying to plan it and then those citizens unplanning it, it's always sabotaging itself, the plot, and yet it does inscribe itself on the surface of the earth uh, against the contours of nature as cities do and as stories do, you know. But uh, I, I really wanted to write about the air. You know, I did not, I do not see this book as a book about issues, about political issues. Uh, one of the main characters, for ex it's not about marginalized people, as you say, at all. You know, it's got characters who, who are all, in some ways, India, India is a society that lives in a very fine grid. Only the West thinks of us as anarchic, 
but we actually live in a very iron grid, a mesh in which everyone lives within their caste, within their community, within their ethnicity. It's less than, a, uh, you know, like, I don't know, 3% or something of people who will marry outside their community. So the characters in this book somehow all have a, a border running through them, a pretty incendiary border running through them, whether it's of gender or caste or religious conversion. And this, uh, and the book, uh, see, it, it sort of begins in the old city of Delhi and then it just spirals out, you know, into the new metropolis, into, uh, I mean, the into Kashmir, as you said, but the nerve center of the book is this place called Jantar Mantar, which has been shut down now, but it used to be the place where protesters from all over India would gather. And it's a place where I spent a lot of time. And one night, I would spend nights there. I mean, it's just, it was just in a most interesting place, you know. And I would, uh, uh, one night when I was there, uh, a baby appeared on the pavement, abandoned. And all these movements, Bhopal, Kashmir, Narmada, all the wisdom, all the politics of all of us didn't know what to do with that abandoned baby. And it uh, made me think, you know, and so it, though, although that's not how the book begins, that is the nerve center, the, the, the scene in Jantar Mantar, the chapter called The Nativity, where this baby who's the antithesis of Christ is born, a little black girl swaddled in garbage. And uh, the story, in fact, that for me, that chapter, it's like the inversion of the ball at the beginning of War and Peace, you know, where all the beautiful people gather. This is the gutter ball, you know, and from there, uh, the story takes you out. And the main other characters outside of the baby, your main character. So, so the f uh, the characters are there is Anjum, she's um, born as Aftab, uh, into a Shia Muslim family in Old Delhi, born as a boy, but uh, soon discovers that she is really a woman trapped in a man's body, and at the age of sixteen leaves home to live in a community of hijras, the Urdu word for trans people. She lives in the Khwabga, which is the house of dreams in Old Delhi, with a group of people who belong to a variety of genders, as complicated as the dunya, which is how they refer to the outside world. Dunya, again, in Urdu means the world. So there's themselves and the world as separate. And Anjum grows up, I mean, spends her teenage years and until she's about 40 there. Uh, one of the most uh, beautiful and most celebrated hijras of, uh, of Delhi, you know, the slow news story, the, the, all the foreign correspondents, everybody courts her, wants, you know, to do this story. And then she actually, uh, and then, you know, but the thing about her, she's not, that's not only who she is. She's not only a hijra. She's a Shia. She's a woman who wants to be a mother. She adopts a little girl. And then she gets caught up in the massacre of 2002 in Gujarat. And of course, caught up not because she's a hijra, but because she's a Muslim. And in fact, she escapes because she's a hijra, and people think it's bad luck to kill a hijra. And this really took place in 2002, the massacre? Yeah. The massacre, of course, it took place under the, when Modi was the chief minister. And then Anjum comes back, is unable to continue life as she knew it, and she moves into a nearby graveyard where her relatives are. And slowly, as she recovers from her trauma, she begins to build a guest house there. Then there's her friend Saddam Hussein, who's a young Dalit, who, who also uh, escapes from a massacre of Dalits, again by the Hindu right. And he, in, a, in, in anger, decides to, to, to do what, Ambed, what Ambedkar, the great leader of the untouchables, did. He said, you must renounce Hinduism. So he renounces Hinduism and becomes a Muslim and calls himself Saddam Hussein. And he's her partner in running the guest house. And then you have 
one of the characters called Garson Hobart, who's a very upper caste, Brahmanical intelligence officer, who is, in a way, part of him is the voice of the state, you know, who understands things in a historical perspective, who has the ability to wait, to watch, to, to, to uh, think in this generous... He's, he's a member of, let's say, the Nehruvian elite, who has been displaced now by this new Hindu right wing. But uh, Hobart, because that's the name of a character he plays in a college play, Garson Hobart is a pretty brilliant person, you know, and someone that all of us do have to contend with. He's not easy meat by any means. And then you have Musa and his friend Tilotama. Both Musa is a Kashmiri, Tilotama, his love, who are both uh, Tilotama is a is a is a strange woman living on the border of sanity and insanity. You know, a very very. Uh, individual and irreverent and lonely woman. Lonely in the sense that she's a loved woman, but she doesn't know how to really receive it because she lives on the borders of so many things. Arundhati Roy is describing her latest novel, her second. It's called The Ministry of Utmost Happiness, and we're going to continue with her in a moment. Yes, this is Democracy Now!, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. Our guest is Arundhati Roy, the author of the new novel, well, now out in paperback, The Ministry of Utmost Happiness. Arundhati won the Booker Prize in 1997 uh, for her first book, The God of Small Things. So, Arundhati Roy, we, we concluded our, our first part of the discussion by talking about the book, The, the Ministry of Utmost Happiness. So, and the book more or less concludes um, with uh, uh, Modi, an allusion to, to, to Modi. You'd said earlier that he's, although formally associated with the uh, Bharatiya Janata Party, I mean, that's how he was elected, his uh, real ties are with the RSS. So could you explain what the RSS stands for and why it's so significant that he's more closely aligned with the RSS than with the BJP? So the RSS today, RSS stands for the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, which is basically a sort of national self-help society. But it is the most powerful organization in the country today. It has, it was founded, as I said, in the 1920s. And uh, it has always believed in rewriting the Constitution. It has openly believed that India should be declared a Hindu nation. Its ideologues have openly <coughs> called Muslims of India, have said, you know, the Muslims of India like the Jews of Germany. Now, uh, it has, it has, it, it is a formidable organization. You know, it has, it works in education, it has women's wings, slum wings, forest dweller wings, publishing wings. It, it, it really writes the story of what is going on today. And it's not just Modi, but almost all his minister, ministers, including the former Prime Minister Vajpayee, Adwani, all of these people were members of the RSS. So whether or not the BJP loses elections or wins elections, the RSS's work is inexorable, you know. It just goes on. And so the BJP is just really the political arm of the RSS. There isn't any way that the BJP can have an independent agenda. It is fused with the RSS. So the danger today is that because of the massive majority with which they came to power, every institution has now been penetrated by the RSS. We're going to do part two of this discussion at democracynow.org. Arundhati Roy, author of the new novel, The Ministry of Utmost Happiness. And that does it for our broadcast. Oh, and yet another Democracy Now! family announcement. Jahan Guzder Turner, welcome to the world. Congratulations to our dear producer, Dina Guzder, and her husband, Peter. What a privilege it was for Nermeen and I to get to hang out with our very dear newest member of the Democracy Democracy Now! family, Jahan. And Jahan, which means world or universe. Welcome to the world. And the universe. I'm Amy Goodman <laughs> with Nermeen Sheikh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>